All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to today's uh, Pioneer Seminar. Uh, I'm Jun Kong, and I'm a uh, the MCERT team in the IGB. And today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Pura Hammond uh, at MIT. And she's a uh, department head of the chemical engineering. And also, she's uh, the David H. Cup professor in engineering of the MIT. And also, she's a fellow of the National Academy of Science, engineering, and also the medicine. And also, she's a fellow of the ACS, AT, and MRS, too. And also, the, uh, if I briefly introduce her background, so she graduated MIT chemical engineering as a BS, and then she worked at the Motorola the, for a while, and then she got the master's degree from Georgia Tech. After that, she moved back to the MIT to get a PhD. And then she worked as a postdoc at Harvard University with the Professor uh, George Whiteside, and then she joined the MIT as a faculty member. So after that, as I introduced, she got lots of the ownership and also she got also lots of the, the awards uh, based on the, her the exceptional academic performance and publications. So if I briefly introduce her awards, uh, it starts from the NSF career. And then she got the, also the Ch Charles Stein Award from the American Institute of the Chemical Engineering and also Material Research Society Turnbull Lectureship Award. So let's welcome her and thanks for your, uh, <clears throat> and also thank you for the, the presenting the seminar today, Dr. Hammond. Thank you so much, June. I'm really excited to be here at Illinois and uh, I have a chance to share some of my work. So I'm going to share my screen here and uh, describe a little bit of the work that we've been doing using poly electrolytes to design drug delivery systems. Um, this is actually work that involves a very simple process known as layer by layer assembly. Now, let me see if I can get the laser pointer that will help. Now this process is based on the idea that you can essentially take a substrate, which can be virtually any charge system, anything that has a uh, a negative or positive charge on its surface and immerse it into a dilute aqueous solution that contains something that is multivalent and of opposite charge. That material system will absorb onto that substrate until ultimately the surface charge is reversed. And at that point, you have a nanoscale thin film that has been absorbed on the substrate. Uh, you can rinse to remove anything that is not electrostatically bound and then absorb another layer. Um, of opposite charge. Because it is a self-limiting adsorption, uh, we can actually build up these films with very consistent uh, thicknesses. And they typically are from a few nanometers thick to a few tens of nanometers thick per layer. We can incorporate a large number of macromolecules into these thin films. And we found that this is particularly interesting when we start thinking about drug delivery, because we can incorporate a broad range of biologic drugs, including RNA, DNA, and proteins into these thin film structures. And that makes it a very interesting system for drug delivery. Um, I should also mention that other kinds of interactions such as hydrogen bonding can also be used to build up these thin films. Now, uh, the idea for creating a thin film that's interesting, for example, for regenerative medicine, is that we can coat anything from a biomedical implant surface to a scaffold with thin films that are releasing. Now, the reason this is interesting is that uh, if we look at our typical polymer, and one of my favorites is polylactic acid, um, for example, a conventional coating that uh, is going to incorporate a biologic often requires the use of a solvent and a little heat. Uh, if you're going to introduce something like a biologic drug, let's say a growth factor into that conventional coating, then there's risk of essentially introducing damage to the protein during that incorporation process due to uh, denaturing. Um, on top of that, it's a polymer system. And for all polymeric systems, when you create a blend, you can only, only go up to a small percentage before you end up getting phase separation. 
If you have phase separation, then you're going to have a bolus release. So typically we're limited to just something like a half to one, maybe two weight percent of the drug that we want to incorporate into our coating. So most of the coating is the polymer matrix and not the drug. Typically, if we incorporate more than one drug into these systems, we also see that there's not a real way to tailor their release profiles. And all the drugs usually come out in the same fashion. So all of these things change when we use layer by layer. Thermodynamics is on the side of incorporating large amounts of drug into these thin films because it is an electrostatic layering process. So if our drug is also a charged drug, let's say it's a protein that under our assembly conditions has a net positive or negative charge, we can actually introduce it in alternation with something like a degradable polymer. For example, these degradable polymers shown up here in the corner, which contain a positive charge are very simple to make and have a nice uh, hydrolyzable ester group, which makes them uh, essentially degradable in the presence of water. So we can actually layer by layer these systems and we can actually select different drugs that can be layered with different polymers and they would release at the rates that are characteristic of the polymer they're layered with, which means that we can have multiple drugs, each with their own independent release profile. On top of that, because the drug is a part of the film, we can get high drug loadings, anywhere from 10 to 15% to as high as 40 or even 50% of the weight of the, of the thin film is the drug in these cases. Finally, if we're able to introduce barrier layers in between these drug layers, we can even get a stagger in which one drug is released and then a second and then a third in a cascade. These kinds of uh, abilities become interesting when we think about delivering a complex set of drugs from something like an implant surface. For example, we may want to deliver a um, small molecule drug like an antibiotic early on and later release growth factors to recruit cells to the location of the implant after we've eliminated the possibility of infection. And this is actually some work that we did do under one of our NIH grants to uh, generate biomedical implant coatings. Now, uh, we've always uh, had an interest in the use of growth factors for regenerative medicine. And work that we did uh, examining bone regeneration the idea was to essentially use known growth factors uh, to speed up either joint implant integration and reduce that recovery time, or perhaps to generate bone in a critical defect. So the growth factors that we were looking at uh, include bone morphogenetic protein 2 or BMP2, which is a highly osteoinductive growth factor. And uh, because it has an isoelectric point that is around eight and a half, uh, we know that we can uh, essentially incorporate this growth factor as a positively charged component in a layer by layer film. But we're also interested in generating a vascular system. So if the first growth factor, which is uh, known to essentially elicit mesenchymal stem cells from the bone marrow nearby to the site of injury and induce uh, essentially differentiation into osteoblasts, which then produce bone. Um, we also want something that will help support the generation of a vascular system. This is particularly important, not so much for the implant application, but if we want to address something like a cranial defect, because we want a very highly vascularized and thick bone to grow. Uh, so here we're using either VEGF or platelet-derived growth factor, PDGF. Um, and these are angiogenic or mitogenic growth factors, which help to support the generation of blood vessels in uh, this uh, bone regenerative space. Now, both of these proteins are positively charged under our assembly conditions. And we have a positively charged polymer that is degradable, which means that we need some sort of negatively charged filler in between the layers. And uh, here we show a common tetralayer that we use where we have the poly beta amino ester, like the one that I showed you previously, um, something negatively charged, then our protein and another negatively charged polymer. And we tended to use, we tend to use uh, glycosoaminoglycans and polysaccharides uh, 
In the work that I'm going to show you, we've used polyacrylic acid as well as a range of uh, polysaccharides like dextran sulfate. So we want to look at whether or not we can regenerate bone in defects that are so large that they can't heal. In this case, typically uh, there needs to be some level of surgical intervention uh, to repair that defect. And in some cases, we can take autologous bone harvest from the patient from a different point. Often this is right around the hip bone, for example. However, the quality of uh, what you can get from bone harvesting varies, of course, with the patient uh, with the amounts of bone available for harvesting and uh, with the uh, nature of the uh, replacement process and often leads to a range of different forms of mor morbidity, uh, both in the defect and in the place where we've actually borrowed the bone. We can also look at artificial implants. Uh, and uh, the problem here, of course, is that there is a, a tissue cell uh, interaction with the uh, material system that can often lead to undesirable side effects. And so the idea is, can we actually generate uh, native bone or at least uh, bone that is very close to the native bone properties without the use of something like a metal or titanium plate? So in our case, we used uh, polylactic glycolic acid degradable membranes as a scaffold. The idea here is that we can alter the degradability of the membrane and uh, essentially generate something that will disappear over time as bone is regenerated. And we'll have a lot of surface area if we use phase inversion to create kind of a, a foamy membrane. Here you can see the cells in the membrane. And then we coat them with our layer by layer films. So here is what uh, these membranes look like when we apply layer by layer assembly to them, uh, we find that we're able to coat uh, both the insides of these pores, although it's a little hard to tell, are, are coated with the BMP. Um, but we also get this top layer, uh, which contains the bulk of the uh, therapeutics. In our case, we were interested in looking at BMP2 by itself and also looking at BMP2 delivered in conjunction with PDGF which is uh, the mitogenic growth factor, which can support uh, the generation of, of blood vessels. So in our case, we layered the PDGF on top of the BMP2 layers. Uh, this created a natural diffusion barrier for the underlying growth factor. When we look at the in vitro release profile, you can see that the PDGF in these cases where we have dual growth factors comes out more rapidly over a period of about a week whereas the BMP2 in the underlying layers comes out over a period that extends out to almost 40 days. So we can actually tune these relative release profiles so that we have the bulk of the uh, minogenic factor coming out early on and the bulk of the BMP2 really coming out over the following weeks. And this gives us a staged release process. Uh, we actually looked at a very simple rat cranial defect model, uh, which gives us an idea of, um, of the kind of defect that we can close. Here, we're looking at a hole in the skull using micro CT, uh, which is a control, an untreated control, and you can see over four weeks that it doesn't close. However, if we have our membrane coated with 0.2 micrograms of BMP2, uh, we get release, which gives us ultimately over a four week period, uh, significant bone deposition. We have bone tissue that has deposited here and we've closed the defect. If we increase the dose even further to two micrograms, we can see that uh, we, we actually have excess bone that forms and there's actually a bit of a lump on the skull as a result of that. Um, we find that in both of these cases, there's closure that's taking place somewhere between the second and the fourth week. When we have BMP2 at 0.2 micrograms and the PDGF at 0.2 micrograms, we find that the closure does seem to be a little bit more rapid, but this was really just the beginning of the question. We really need to look at the histology to understand uh, what the nature of the bone is that's being formed. 
and whether or not we're getting something like native bone. So here we can see the untreated defect in a cross section. Here we can see the membrane. Uh, if we just put the PLGA membrane down and we don't introduce any growth factors, we end up with cells that are fibroblasts that crawl across the membrane and deposit a collagenous network, but there's no calcium, there's no bone formation. If we look at the membrane with 0.2 micrograms, we have bone that's generated and here we have the excess. We see the bump that I was describing before, um, but we also see that the tissue itself is not quite the same as the native tissue. We have, um, a lot of uh, bone up deposition, uh, but not a lot of vascularization. On top of that, we have a lot of defects that are present throughout the bone, and we have this uneven contour uh, in both cases, which suggests that there's not a lot of remodeling of the bone that takes place after deposition. When we have a combination system of PDGF being released early on and BMP2 coming a little bit later, uh, we find that we end up with this very well-formed and highly remodeled bone. Uh, we see that uh, the native bone uh, is very much like uh, the uh, regenerated bone. And in mechanical tests, we found that uh, this bone also matched the mechanical properties, unlike our earlier examples. What we think is happening in part is that we are supporting the regeneration of those blood vessels early on uh, that are able to bridge across this membrane. Um, and that actually, as bone uh, begins to be generated around these vessels, allows the uh, osteoclasts to arrive after osteoblasts. And osteoclasts are bone cells that are specialized to do remodeling. They deposit enzymes that break the bone down and then allow uh, realignment of that bone and remodeling, which gives us that high strength bone that we want. We continue to do our work in bone regeneration. And right now we actually have a study going on with uh, collaborators at UT Health in rabbits. Uh, so we're going to find out a lot more, but we're looking at the relative rates of release in our rat cranial defect model and finding that slow is better. And now we're looking at the rabbit model and it's a mandibular jaw model in which we're looking for uh, whether or not we can have uh, this nice bone regeneration and a load bearing animal model and whether uh, the presence of the second factor is important in that case. In the meantime, we're beginning to, we've also been, begun looking at soft tissue. And in this work, we were interested in correcting wound healing. And the target was chronic wounds uh, for our original work the idea of correcting the overexpression of genes that are highly overexpressed in wounds that go wrong. In chronic wounds, uh, or often, for example, diabetic ulcers, where you have hyperglycemic patients, there are some factors that get overexpressed over others. And that leads to a difficulty in the closure of the wound. One of those overexpressed factors is uh, a metallic, metalloproteinase, uh, MMP9, MMP9 actually breaks down collagen and it has a wonderful role in remodeling because once you have a significant amount of collagen that is deposited in the wound, uh, you're able to then uh, have these MMPs help to break down and remodel that tissue, part of the remodeling process. But if MMP9 is present at concentrations that are uh, essentially higher than they should be early on in the healing process, uh, you're not able to actually accumulate enough collagen to close the wound because it's getting broken down. So the idea here is to address this case where you have excess MMP9 by silencing the MMP9 gene for uh, temporary periods of time. And siRNA is perfect for that. The problem, of course, is that siRNA is also highly susceptible to degradation. So the question is, can we release siRNA from a wound healing scaffold or dressing uh, directly to a wound environment where there's a large amount of enzymatic activity and uh, essentially redox activity going on that can help to break chains down and certainly can attack siRNA. So we did this by essentially building a two-part layer by layer film architecture in which uh, at the bottom layers we have a degradable layer of 
poly two, which is our nickname for one of our favorite poly beta amino esters and uh, dextran sulfate shown here, which is inert. And uh, then on top of that inert, but degradable layer, we build layers with chitazan, which is a nice positively charged polysaccharide, but not degradable over any time frame of interest to us, and siRNA. And it turns out that because chitazan and siRNA form films which contain high loadings of siRNA, uh, my student at the time decided to go with this particular formulation to achieve the loading that we need for a chronic wound. Um, so here we're showing the schematic of building this dual uh, system. We used a labeled siRNA, so we can actually look for uh, the green fluorescence to see our siRNA is incorporated in the film and that the film is uh, coating this tegaderm dressing, which is a woven dressing. We can see that it's in the crevices. It coats every available surface. And this is one of the characteristics of layer by layer is that you can coat conformally down to the nanometer length scale. So what we can see here is that the siRNA loading is linearly increasing with the number of bilayers. We have uh, a, a kind of absolute control of the total loading simply by adding more film. The rate of degradation, of course, also varies. Um, if we change the amount of degradable material underneath, and uh, here we can see uh, this is the Y or the top layers being buried. Here X or the degradable layers are being buried and we see a dramatic difference in the release profile for the same number of layers being released. Um, we use a diabetic mouse model, a DBDB mouse model, which is a natively diabetic mouse. And uh, we introduced these simple puncture wounds and uh, we then applied a test bandage. Uh, that test bandage either contained the SI against MMP9 or a scrambled SI RNA, which uh, was not going to target any gene. And we also looked at uncoated animals. Because rats always heal, as rodents tend to do, um, we know that there's going to be wound closure. So our endpoints were whether or not we increase the rate of wound closure at early points in time and also whether we were able to silence the expression of MMP9 directly in the wound, indicating that the sRNA was active. Here we're looking at one week in MMP9 expression in our controls versus the MMP9 containing uh, system shows that we silenced MMP9 uh, by about 60% in one week. And over a two week period that goes down to about 20% which implies that we're continuously releasing siRNA to get this cumulative effect that increases over time. MMP9 activity also decreased accordingly. When we look at the seven and the 14 day treated animals, at the top, you can see the treated animal and collagen is blue here. You can see a blue ridge of collagen across the wound. These are the margins of the wound. Uh, the untreated, shows that uh, we don't have any real collagen being deposited in uh, the wound itself. After 14 days, even though we see that the wounds are beginning to close because these are um, uh, mice, uh, we do see that there's a significant amount of uh, accumulation of collagen. Uh, essentially, we're getting that granulation tissue that we need for uh, the closure of a wound and ultimately what would lead to remodeling over longer time frames. Here we can see a close up of that uh, tissue compared to the untreated wound, a significantly greater amount. We also see that uh, in the black bars, um, our rate of closure is much higher over the seven and 14 days, both for the PC muscle and the epithelial closure. Chronic wounds are interesting, but uh, another very common uh, sort of wound aberration is uh, the generation of scars. And this is where another part of the wound healing process goes awry. And we have an overproduction of, uh, of essentially collagen by fibroblasts. And uh, the question is, how can we silence uh, that process? Um, the reason we want to is because for third degree wounds, 
uh, there can often be huge amounts of scarring uh, in trying to heal from those uh, burns, third degree burns. Uh, and there are a number of surgical procedures which lead to um, wounds that may experience significant amounts of uh, scarring. If we can stop that process, if we can essentially eliminate this overexpression, uh, then we might be able to decrease the amount of scar tissue because scar tissue is not functional tissue. Uh, having a large amount of scarring can have a huge impact on uh, both function and um, uh, the cosmetic aspects um, of the skin. Here we're looking at the target CTGF, which is connective tissue growth factor, uh, which is known to be very active in uh, fibrosis. And the idea is let's silence CTGF uh, over earlier periods of the wound healing process. I should mention that CTGF has been a target for some time, but small molecule inhibitors haven't been found to be very effective and uh, sometimes have shown some unwanted side effects. SIRNA is a great approach, but again, we need to be able to protect that SIRNA. So we use the same sort of layer by layer approach. This time, because we're studying uh, this system with a third degree burn model in which we sew up the region around the third degree burn, we're coating silk suture instead of a, a tegaderm bandage. Um, and here you can see that the coating uniformly coats the woven structure and that we're getting once again, this consistent loading. And in the third degree burn model, which was uh, performed um, essentially uh, by Marty Yarmish's lab uh, at Mass General, we can see that we have this third degree burn area stitched up. And if we follow, we see that for the uncoated or untreated animals, we have this closure where these two lines become one line in the middle. And this midline is really a line of scar tissue. You get extreme shrinkage with scarring. Um, however, with SICTGF, we see that we're able to maintain some of the distance between the sutures. Uh, although it's not a complete um, elimination of scar, we see that there's a great reduction in the degree of shrinkage. We also see that CTGF expression has been silenced and other uh, markers such as alpha smooth muscle actin, TEMP1, collagen 1A1, all of which are uh, high expressors in, uh, in uh, scar tissue are lowered. We can also see that the tissue is more functional. Uh, one way of seeing this is uh, by looking for blood vessels and we can see in our treated tissue that there are more of these blood vessels. Hopefully you can see these small cross sections of blood vessels here compared to what we see in the control animals. We also found that there were indicators of uh, essentially the beginnings of hair follicle uh, structures in, these, in this skin compared to the scar skin that we saw in the control animals. Here we can look at the uh, number of vessels uh, quantitatively and see that uh, we can uh, essentially have a very meaningful increase in vascularity of this tissue. So we've continued to work on this problem. Actually, right now we have moved to looking at some new targets that involve microRNAs in a, in a new project that is just launching in our lab. And the idea there is that we may be able to control entire sets of genes which are involved in wound healing to improve the wound healing process. All right, and uh, just doing a quick time check because I can't see time on my, uh, on my screen. I think, yes, we have plenty of time to talk about layer by layer assembly as it applies to nanoparticles. So um, I'd like to describe a little bit of that work. In our lab, we're at the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. And the focus there is to bring engineers together with biologists, cancer cell biologists, to uh, address cancer. And uh, our approach has been one that has been highly informed by our interactions with uh, cancer cell biologists, which is that there are a number of cancers which are highly resistant to uh, more common uh, uh, therapeutic molecules. Uh, for example, ovarian cancer, uh, triple negative breast cancer, these are cancers which often recur and they recur uh, because there are genetic mutations present uh, 
which enable some of those cells to uh, survive chemotherapy treatment. And those cells then live on and recur and generate new tumors that are highly resistant to the original treatment. So the way of getting at this kind of um, cancer is that we are looking at a dual release in which we have a chemotherapy drug, which is encapsulated in a liposome. So we generate negatively charged liposomes uh, using phospholipids and uh, incorporate our drug within. Uh, this can also be a polymeric drug nanoparticle that has been modified so that it presents, let's say, a negative charge. We then adsorb a positively charged layer on top of it, and then a negatively, negatively charged layer that contains, um, let's say, a nucleic acid that will silence the target gene in that cancer cell. We'll then cap that off with a positively charged polymer. So now we have a plus minus plus sandwich uh, that is protecting the nucleic acid in the middle. Finally, we can't put a positively charged nanoparticle into the bloodstream without it absorbing huge amounts of plasma proteins and getting uh, essentially trafficked away from the tumor and rapidly cleared through the body. Uh, so we need uh, an outer layer that will provide the nanoparticle with a stealth property. It needs to be strongly negatively charged we use negative charge in this case to help prevent the interaction of these nanoparticles with uh, negatively charged cells that are present. And most cells uh, have large numbers of negatively charged glycans on their surface. We also wanted to be highly hydrated uh, because those uh, waters of hydration essentially provide both a kind of disguise for these nanoparticles. They're not really uh, recognized and engaged with by other cells as readily. Um, but they also introduce um, these uh, energetic penalties for disruption of the water layer. So um, here we're going to use a negatively charged polymer that will give us those nice properties. Now, um, as I mentioned, we can coat liposomes. This is a, a, essentially a TEM image of liposomes. And here we have layer by layer coated liposomes. And you can see that they, we maintain the size the layers that we're putting down are somewhere between 10 and 20 nanometers. So we're not really doing a significant increase in the size of what is typically a 100 nanometer liposome. And we can do the same thing with the coating of nanoparticles of any size. So the whole idea is that this is very much like those candies you buy where you can stuff the core with one kind of therapy or flavor, but you surround it with others and we slowly release one and then the other. Now, a, a nanoscale particle is, uh, we, there's still a lot of debate about how nanomedicine works and how it can best be used. But um, for a number of tumors that grow rapidly, it's believed that uh, there are defects in the blood vessels. Uh, and if those are present, then you get a much greater accumulation of nanoparticles that are injected in the bloodstream in the tumor regions because of the defects in those blood vessels, which are essentially uh, small holes that are around the size of the nanoparticle. Um, and uh, you know, this is uh, one way of thinking about it is that you have a uh, nanoparticle that gets in and once it gets in, it spends a lot of time in the pockets and uh, interstices of the uh, tumor matrix and has a lot of time to spend with cells before it finds another leak and comes out the other end. And the idea is during that interaction time, we have time to get these nanoparticles to interact with the tumor cells we're targeting. And then once inside, we want to uh, essentially get that nanoparticle to transform from one that is fairly stealthy to one that will have a lot of interaction with the cells we're targeting. And layer by layer films actually give us a lot of tools to make these nanoparticles engage or um, adhere or bind to cancer cells. One that is fairly simple is the fact that we're layering a poly acid with a poly base. Um, for example, one can imagine that if we have poly L lysine, uh, which is a, a primary amine containing polymer uh, as one layer. And on top of that, we introduce hyaluronic acid or one of the other polysaccharides that has a large number of carboxylic acids on it we have NH2, we have COOH. Uh, when these are layered atop each other, 
although we have a net negative charge at the condition of assembly, as we change the conditions, for example, lower the pH, we protonate those carboxylic acid anions. And when we do that, we actually are erasing negative charge. The net result is that ultimately the underlying positive charge can become more important. Uh, and we get either a nanoparticle that goes to neutral or in some cases can even become slightly positive. Here you can see one example where we start at pH 7.4 we begin to titrate those carboxylic acids at a lower pH. And because we're erasing negative charge, we're also erasing ionic crosslinks. So we get a swelling of these uh, layers, which causes this to uh, give us a much thicker uh, bilayer. On the other hand, we also can watch not only the swelling, but the shift in charge. And here, as we go from uh, pH 7.4 to something like just 6.6, .6, we see that we're going to uh, greatly decrease the charge in the nanoparticle. It's no longer a repulsive nanoparticle. And for that reason, when it's in the tumor interstitium, tumors tend to be hypoxic. And even a slight amount of hypoxia uh, causes a lowering in the pH in the tumor microenvironment. So as we go from the bloodstream to the tumor, we have an opportunity to take advantage of this nanoparticle, which loses uh, a large amount of its negative charge and gets taken up more readily by uh, all of the cells that are present there just through uh, non-specific interactions with this uh, now sort of swollen neutral nanoparticle. So this is one advantage that and one way of targeting. But typically we want to uh, be even more specific in targeting. Uh, we want to have a high affinity for the tumor cells that we're targeting and not just, for example, the macrophages nearby or the fibroblasts nearby. Um, and there are ways of doing this by using a molecular label, a ligand or a protein that binds to receptors that are overexpressed by the tumor cell. That greatly increases the affinity of the nanoparticle for the tumor. What we found with our system is that hyaluronic acid itself um, which is already a known ligand for CD44, uh, is a great means of targeting uh, these cancer cells. Um, hyaluronic acid on our outer layer allows us to greatly and uh, effectively target a range of solid epithelial tumor cells. These are triple negative breast cancer cells, and you can see um, the red labeled nanoparticle within the cells here. Um, we can look at sections of tumor uh, that are stained uh, and uh, see that essentially these are stromal cells of the cancer that are protecting the cancer, but they're not oncogenic cells, uh, but they form a protective layer around these growing tumor, uh, tumor cells. The tumor cells are labeled uh, with CD44 and there's uh, essentially this red region here where we see the tumor cells. And we see that nanoparticles, which here are labeled green, co-associate with the tumor cells very effectively. So we have a range of different ways in which we can target the nanoparticles to cancer cells. There's a lot of work that goes into making sure that that targeting leads to the action that we want, which is intracellular uptake and trafficking of the nanoparticle into and then ultimately out of the endosome to release siRNA and to release those DNA damaging drugs that we're using. Now, uh, in one example, non-small cell lung cancer, we um, are looking at a way of approaching um, lung cancer, especially more aggressive forms of lung cancer. Uh, there are some frequent mutations in the aggressive forms. One of them is the presence of the KRAS oncogene, and the other is the loss of a gene known as P53. Now the KRAS oncogene is uh, one that causes much more um, aggressive growth and uh, progression of the cancer. It also enhances the resistance of cancer to a range of DNA damaging drugs. Uh, KRAS itself isn't very easily drugged with small molecule inhibitors. So siRNA against KRAS is a great way to address um, this particular onco uh, oncogene. P53 is actually a protective gene. Uh, it's a guardian gene that monitors the amount of DNA damage that is taking place in cells. 
And when there's significant DNA damage present, it directs the cell to apoptosis or, or programmed cell death. However, if P53 is missing, um, when it's doing, we don't have anything that's monitoring uh, this DNA damage or change. And when we have cancer cells propagating, they're able to propagate without check. So um, we are introducing a microRNA, MIR34A, which actually does some of this work uh, directly. And by introducing MIR34A, we can then replace some of these effector functions of P53. So we created a uh, combination nanoparticle. The core was a liposome that contained uh, cisplatin, which is a common platinum uh, containing drug. And uh, we then coated with polyalarginine. Uh, we added then our two nucleic acids, SI against KRAS and the micro uh, RNA. And we then have our polyalarginine. So there's our protective sandwich. And then we have our outer layer of hyaluronic acid. When we look at the release profiles of, of uh, particles like this, siRNA comes out much more rapidly as the outer layer, and the core component comes out more slowly by about three, a factor of three or four. So we can get a bit of a stagger, and this gives us time to silence and reprogram the cells uh, before we introduce the chemotherapy drug, making them much more sensitive to that drug. Now, uh, one of the issues, of course, is targeting. And this is a non-small cell lung uh, cancer model that was developed in the Tyler Jacks lab uh, at MIT's Koch Institute. Here, um, we're looking at healthy mice on the left. Here we have these mice that have these tumors that have the, SI, the, uh, the KRAS oncogene and lack p53 And uh, these are essentially, um, you can see that the, the uh, lung cancer lights up. Um, we can actually look at uh, where the nanoparticles go in these mice. And in healthy mice, they get excreted through the liver. Uh, however, when we look at these lung cancer mice, we see that not only do we get that excretion, but we also see a significant accumulation in the lungs. We get about 40 to 50 fold more accumulation in those tumor lungs. Now, if we incorporate our drugs into the nanoparticle, uh, we can see uh, that we're going to get targeting. The targeting is due to CD44, which is highly present in the tumor lungs. We can essentially track these animals over time. And as you can see, we have the control animal in which we have a very rapid generation. These are really aggressive tumors. Uh, and uh, if we have RNA only or just the cisplatin only, we see some reduction in the tumor volume. Uh, but with the combination, we see that the tumor volume is significantly reduced. We also see that uh, in the survival rate of the mice, um, we get uh, only a slight improvement with just RNA in our particle, more improvement with cisplatin in our nanoparticle, but with both, we get a 30% improvement in survivability. So we've been really excited about this platform and we've really, uh, been interested in applying it toward ovarian cancer. And so uh, I'm gonna try and spend the last few minutes explaining how we can use uh, an exploration of layer by layer surface chemistry interactions with cells to do that. Uh, we decided to look at a broader set of outer layers, not only hyaluronic acid, but perhaps a range of other polysaccharides and polyacids and determine their relative affinities to different cancer cell types. And uh, here we're looking at um, our process. We have a rapid assembly process for creating bilayers in which we put down poly -L arginine And then we put down a range of different uh, sulfated and carboxylated uh, poly electrolytes, which are shown here. So this was a small library. We then took a large number of cells, 10 ovarian cancer cell lines, mm -hmm. seven healthy cell lines, uh, later, we actually expanded this to a range of additional cells. And we looked at essentially how these uh, nanoparticles, when they're incubated in uh, these uh, uh, rapid throughput well arrays, um, how they associate with the cell types that we've chosen. And we used uh, FACS or cell sorting, fluorescent so cell sorting to determine uh, the differences. And here we can see uh, an example where we have a large amount of uptake uh, with nanoparticles compared to untreated cells. And we could look at the degree of uptake with our labeled nanoparticles. 
And what we found uh, on here, you can see uh, the further right you are, the more uptake there is of a given nanoparticle that polyaspartic acid, glutamic acid, and hyaluronic acid all give us a significant amount of uptake compared to just a standard nanoparticle uh, when they're exposed to ovarian cancer cells. Uh, but what was really interesting was that these uh, other two, hyaluronic acid we know, actually have an even higher affinity uh, than hyaluronic acid for ovarian cancer cells and that is not exhibited in the healthy cells. So what is going on? We're still trying to understand some of the interactions that are involved. But we did decide to look at how these nanoparticles interact with cells. And what we found, uh, let's see here, is that with hyaluronic acid, we get what we expect, which is that the nanoparticles associate with the membrane receptor and then get taken inside of the uh, cell where they ultimately escape the endosome. Uh, whereas polyglutamic acid uh, essentially accumulates on the outside of the cell membrane and just sits there for very long time periods with very little uptake. So it's as if the nanoparticle was just sitting outside of the membrane, uh, but not getting uptake. So whatever it is engaging with is not inducing endocytosis. poly l acid was somewhere in between. Uh, it's only different by one methylene spacer, but it led to uptake. The uptake was um, essentially dependent on a different protein than the uptake for hyaluronic acid. It depended on the presence of a protein known as caviolin instead of clathrin. It took longer to be to get taken up. And uh, essentially we had this sort of slow process of particle binding, accumulation at the membrane and uptake. So um, this is something interesting because it means the outer layer can actually steer the nanoparticle to different parts of the cell simply by changing this outer layer chemistry. This is something we're still looking at, how we can understand where the particle goes and why based on these different uh, polyelectrolyte brush layer interactions. Uh, and we think that this is unique because uh, we actually have a platform that allows us to look at a very broad range of polyelectrolytes and examine families of different systems that interact with different cell types. But we thought that that polyglutamic acid system was particularly interesting. The reason for that is that it hangs out on the outside of a tumor cell, it doesn't go inside. That means it doesn't undergo endocytosis. Endocytosis leads to the generation of an acidic vesicle that can break down something like a protein drug. Um, and often we want protein drugs to interact with nearby receptors on other cells. So this outside sticking nanoparticle could actually be used as a vehicle for delivery of proteins to neighboring cells. This gave us the idea that maybe we could deliver something that can essentially impact neighboring cells like immune cells in a tumor environment. So we began working with uh, my colleague, Daryl Irvin, on the idea of incorporating cytokines, which are proteins that play a very significant role in the signaling that takes place in an inflammatory response. Uh, typically, tumors will have some infiltrated uh, immune cells present. And in those cases, when the immune cells are present, you can use something like uh, the well-known um, uh, inhibitors that keep regulatory T cells from making those immune cells inactive. But in ovarian cancer, those therapies don't work. And the reason is because those tumors don't have a large number of nearby immune cells to begin with. So the idea here is that we can use cytokines, which are very general in terms of the inflammatory, they, uh, inflammatory response that they generate. It's an innate response. Uh, they cause the generation of interferons, like interferon gamma, uh, by a number of cells. And uh, once interferon gamma is generated, uh, then you begin to get activation of uh, uh, essentially the uh, leukocytes that you want. Uh, here we can get B cells activated, we can get T cells activated, and they can then begin to make their way to the tumor and attack the tumor. So the idea is that we're going to start this sort of train of uh, immune response by initiating the generation of IL-12 through this artificial 
method of introducing a nanoparticle bound to a tumor cell. Now, um, IL-12 has been interesting to begin with because people have known that it has this power to make a cold tumor environment hot. However, it also has a large number of side effects. So if you just uh, systemically deliver it, it can also um, set off the immune response in the body and you can get this uh, significant cytokine storm effect. And that has led to clinical trials due to these side effects. Um, so it hasn't been successful uh, for that reason. So we decided to use layer by layer as a way to package up IIL-12. And we do this by taking a liposome and then uh, taking a uh, essentially a linker. In our er earlier work, we used a, a nickel histidine linker. Now we're using a malleamid linker to attach the cytokine to the lipid. We then uh, coat, and there you can see the nickel hiss uh, structure. We then coat with our layer by layer foam. So we put down polyalarginine and then a negatively charged polymer. In our case, we looked at polyglutamic acid for that uh, property that I described earlier. Now we uh, may, before we even go further, want to talk about how the cytokine actually gets out of the particle if it's wrapped in this uh, polyelectrolyte bilayer. It turns out that the bilayer itself, because it is only two layers and because um, it is being introduced into uh, an environment that is slightly acidic, um, undergoes a kind of unwrapping um, that happens because you're titrating the charge gradually of those outer layers. So what we can do is label the cytokine. Here we've labeled the cytokine blue and we can label the polycation, polyalarginine, here we've labeled that red, and we can use FRET to tell when they actually make their way away from uh, the uh, nanoparticle itself. And we can see essentially that um, first we can get polyalarginine that begins to shed uh, right around, uh, we get to the half-life maybe around uh, five or 10 hours. And the uh, release here of the cytokine is coming uh, shortly afterward. So we are seeing that release take place. And this is sort of a cartoon of what we picture is happening once we get those nanoparticles anchored to the ovarian cancer cell. Uh, so the question is, can this actually work in a real ovarian cancer uh, setting? So we actually did um, look at first whether or not our nanoparticle uh, could essentially eliminate the toxicity that we can see with regular IL-12. Here we have just pure IL-12, the protein, introduced systemically, we get huge weight loss and there are some tox-related deaths. However, with our nanoparticle, we don't see that weight loss, we don't see the significant amount of death. Uh, and if we look at uh, injections of uh, 10 micrograms intraperitoneal injections, which are directly into uh, that abdominal cavity, um, here we have the dextrose control you see a rapid a loss of uh, all of the animals um, uh, when we are just going to use dextrose. Uh, if we use IL-12, we get to delay that death, but it still happens. And upon injection, we get some animals that die um, right away because of the toxicity of the IL-12. However, uh, we're able to get a much more extended amount of survivability uh, when we introduced our IL-12 nanoparticle as shown here. And uh, ultimately we have animals that survive um, and, and get a full cure or, or recovery. We're able to show that the uh, IL-12 nanoparticles um, are actually localized to the tumors. Um, and uh, we can see here um, that we have a different set of uh, nanoparticles shown in different colors, unlayered nanoparticles, our IL-12 and our PLE IL-12 nanoparticles. And we can see that there's a significant upregulation of the cells in the tumor, as you can see here, uh, in KT, NK, and CD8 positive T cells. Uh, when we look in the ascites, we see less activity, and we certainly see less activity in the spleen. This is something that we want because we really want to focus uh, the targeting of this very strong cytokine uh, to the tumor itself. We've also looked in other models. And so uh, this is uh, 
you know, we looked at HM1, which was one syngeneic model where we had moderate T cell activity. We wanted to look at this KPCA uh, model, which was a mostly cold tumor, uh, but one that responds to, responds to certain kinds of inhibitors. And um, we found that uh, the KPCA uh, model was even more responsive to our treatment. And this is the original HM1 data. This is the KPCA data. Uh, and the IL-12 from the PLE nanoparticle, we got 100% survival in this study. We also found that we could look at various combinations of uh, the inhibitor and uh, our IL-12 system and uh, get a, a really uh, strong response, especially when we combine all of these together. And this is going out over 120 days. So in summary, we've been able to examine this as an approach for delivering cytokines and upregulating the immune response in difficult tumors, including uh, ovarian cancer. And now we're looking at how we can manipulate when the IL-12 gets released in a, more, um, in, a, in a manner that's more intrinsic to the tumor environment and uh, how we can actually look at combinations that may give us an even more powerful response. So I won't spend time on this last example, only to say that we are working on drug delivery to glioblastoma. So this is a story for another day. We're looking at infectious disease and we're looking at how we can use these systems to more effectively deliver vaccines. Um, so uh, hopefully I explained that we can use these layer by layer systems to have highly tunable surface uh, delivery as well as uh, targeting in nanoparticles. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the students who did the work, including Lee Gu, Santi, uh, Korea, uh, both of whom are off on their own now, with Natalie and Tony, uh, Brett and Brandon. I didn't get to talk about their work as much, but um, I'd like to acknowledge everyone in the lab and uh, welcome any questions you have. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> so if there is any question from the audience, the audience can unmute yourself and then ask any questions. If not, I can start to read the question from Brandon. Or if Brandon, can, can you ask the question? Oh, sure. Yeah, no, I, I'm happy to. Um, first, Paul, thank you very much. That was, a, that, was a, that was a great talk. And I actually had two sort of related questions. One was a little bit more science and I think you've shown some really beautiful approaches to using layer, layer by layer approaches to address particularly temporal release of multiple factors or change localization. I was curious whether some of these methods allow you to add in spatial localization as well. There's some of the, the sort of backpack techniques you're mentioning at the end could perhaps get to that, but I wasn't sure whether the, there's ways, particularly in the regenerative medicine side, you could have different effects at wound margins versus central regions as well. But more generically, I was also just curious about, um, you, you run a large lab that's really collaborative. And, and so I was curious about strategies you, you like about encouraging trainees to work, bring their own perspectives um, and work um, collaboratively. You know, our, our institute is big on team science. And so ways in which you motivate that type of parts in your lab, I'm curious about as well. Oh, that's great. Um, for the first question, I do think that we can, con we can control localized delivery if we have multi-component systems, for example, we can coat one surface with one set of uh, growth factors and uh, maybe it's a patch that goes on to a larger piece that is coated differently. So I think if we, if we use uh, the, this kind of approach of selective, uh, either selectively coating different areas or creating, um, I, I had a student who actually created what he called stickers uh, in which you can actually build these layer by layer films and then lift them off uh, at, with tweezers and, and reapply them to another surface. I think with that kind of approach, we may be able to stick them in different places and get the effects that we want in different regions of an implant, for example. And then for the second question, the collaboration is really important in our lab and has always been important to me. I think that's where uh, a lot of the joy of science comes. And, I encourage my students first by um, when they come to lab, letting them know that uh, we try to create a supportive environment in which each student has uh, a question that they own, a part of the problem that they own that they need to tackle. 
uh, but it's going to be connected to a larger picture that is a part of what everyone else is working on. And with that kind of approach, everyone feels enabled because they know that they have the piece that will kind of be what they think of as their sort of signature or what they are going to really contribute to um, in, in a unique way. But they're also going to be working side by side with others um, to put together something that is bigger than that, that's a bigger, uh, bigger picture than what they could accomplish by themselves. And I think that helps them understand that, that, um, that you can have both um, that uh, sort of individual accomplishment and that ability to then take what you've learned and work with your colleague and do something even more exciting. I also try to encourage uh, when, when we, we have a lot of collaborations, uh, the, the students and postdocs actually be the ones who kind of run the collaboration. So, um, you know, when we have meetings, they, they are often the ones who are calling the meetings and pulling us together and um, sorting things out. Uh, it, it allows them to actually have a chance to experience um, the process of, of, of project uh, management and, and engaging with colleagues and working together. Thank you. That was great. So, Tyre, do you want to ask a question? I can see your question on the chat box. But... Sure. Hi, Paula. Hi. Good to see you after a long time. Good to see you. <laughs> Sure, sure. Uh, nice talk. I was so impressed by some of the results that you presented. One is the uh, HA coated nanoparticles. Uh, what fraction of the total number of particles that reached the target? Um, and what happens to the ones that didn't get to the, didn't get to the target, to the tumor? Great questions. Um, I'll use ovarian cancer because that's the one we've done the most amount of uh, in vivo measurement. Um, but typically for the hyaluronic acid systems, um, if it's injected IV, we can get something that's closer to like maybe 10% injected dose in the tumors. Uh -huh. um, when we're working with uh, uh, lines such as Avcar8, a number of others which are uh, more mesenchymal in nature. Um, and we also find that, uh, and of course, uh, the story with all nanoparticles is that you get excretion and filtration. So it shows up in liver and sometimes spleen. Uh, so uh, depending on what endpoint you're at, you, we see a circulation half-life in the blood that's somewhere around 24 to 28 hours. And uh, so, you know, if you, if you wait for longer time periods, then the places where you're gonna see lighting up is the liver spleen. Uh -huh. and, um, then for the uh, IP injection, which is intra intraperitoneal, mm -hmm. they didn't have a lot of time to talk about that, but we did a lot of comparisons between the two. Intraperitoneal for these ovarian cancer sort of sticky nanoparticles, we get um, really high, maybe 85 to 90% of the particles are associated with um, tumor cells um, for the models that we've looked at. Now we're beginning to move to these other models. So we're going to learn if the ascites creates differences and things of that nature. But right now we can see that there's a huge amount of accumulation because we're injecting the nanoparticles right where the tumors reside. And then the rest, of course, again, ends up in the liver over longer time frames. And then of course we think that excretion, we can see that uh, there's excretion that takes place. Okay, even 10% is a very large fraction compared to most of the other data that I have seen so far. Absolutely. And, and frankly, even uh, for therapies where folks are getting two or 3% injected is better than the small molecule, which is, ugh, you know, um, a blink in the eye. Sort yeah, of. yeah, that's right. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. So I'll take one more question. So, Kizong, can you ask a question? I can see you. <clears throat> Okay, I, I can try my internet connection is not good. It was such a wonderful talk and uh, blow my mind, <laughs> Dr. Hammond. Um, so I, I am a neuroscientist. I collaborate with um, Hanjin. Um, and I was thinking, you know, do you, do you see the localization of your HA conjugated nanoparticles in the brain? And um, have you worked on any brain diseases with your nanoparticles? Yes, that's, those are great questions. We're working right now on glioblastoma um, because in glioblastoma, there are 
there's there's uh, definitely evidence that the BBB is is more compromised. So we get a little bit more of, of an angle at it. it. You still need it's still much more difficult than uh, a typical tumor. Um, we have used um, uh, HA functionalized with transferrin. We need transferrin to get uh, transcytosis. Um, we've also begun looking at so so we have a new project in glioblastoma where we've begun looking at a family of peptides um, that have been known to enhance transcytosis over endocytosis um, at, uh, endoth with endothelial cells. And uh, we're trying to examine those now. In fact, um, uh, I think what's really interesting is the possibility of, uh, of finding ex vivo ways to um, measure them more effectively. Uh, and then we go into uh, these sophisticated models but uh, the early work that we've done has shown that, uh, that uh, some of these peptides are going to be effective. And the question that we're asking is, can we combine them with this outer layer, this sort of fuzzy hyaluronic acid outer layer? Okay, so I'll take one more question from Kathy. So she's asking what makes the HA sticky to tumors? Excellent, um, HA actually is, a naturally occurring polysaccharide that's a native part of our extracellular matrix. So um, a lot of our tissues have are, are infiltrated with hyaluronic acid, um, and when cells are growing or you know essentially moving, uh, they actually use the CD44 receptor to bind to hyaluronic acid as part of the matrix. However, um, tumors and tumor cells are in this hyperproliferative state. Uh, and they are mobile. So they tend to have a huge overexpression of CD44, um, a couple fold over what we would see in normal cells. So what we end up with is um, a hyaluronic acid coated nanoparticle is very, has a very strong binding avidity to that CD44 receptor, high presence of it on, um, on the tumor cells. All right, thank you very much. So now it's 107, so I needed to actually make the, the Dr. Hammond to move to the next meeting. So I the personally have also my, the, my own question, but I will actually kind of uh, <laughs> take you actually ask that later. So thank you so much for today's outstanding seminar. And also thank you also for you know, being with us today. So, and also I would like to thank all audience to, to stay actually to the end. So thank you so much, and then uh, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the schedule. Thank you. Thank you.